Asterix in Britain is the eighth adventure of Asterix the Gaul, and was first published in 1966. It was written by René Gossini, and drawn by Albert Udezu. The comic book was adapted as an animated film in 1986, and as a live-action movie in 2012. How faithful was the cartoon adaptation? Let's see if we can spot 20 of its differences. I would like you to meet Obelix, my good friend. A friend of yours is a friend of mine. I'd be proud if you shake me by the hand. Ah! No! That is not what he meant. Well, he asked me to shake him by the hand. He is my distant cousin from Britain. And they, they do not talk the same way we do. Jolly good show. Quite. I say it has gone a bit numb. The story starts with the series' recurring pirate characters, Captain Redbeard, who for the first few appearances wore red instead of green, his first mate Pegleg, forever making wry comments in Latin, and Baba. The difference to this scene in the film is that the lookout seems to have a stutter. Where is she? Look out! Uh, on the port, on the port, on the oh, port! my port side! There! Roll, roll, roll! The roll man. And the crew are joined by a young man with cockeyed eyes and a headband. I guess we sure were lucky that it wasn't the Gauls! Caesar's invasion of Britain is taken up by only one page in the comic, whereas in the film the sequence goes on for nearly ten minutes by expanding on visuals and adding comical sequences, such as the Roman navy crashing into each other due to the signalman losing his temper with a seagull, and the Englishman playing a game of cricket. Can we get back to our battle? Oh no question of thing, we're off for two days. Sorry, we're closed for the weekend. Centurion Voluptuous Artery Cirrhosis from the 19th Asterix comic is used instead of the equally plump Governor Encyclopedia Britannicus, here renamed General Motus. The character also acts as the general in charge of Caesar's army when he invades Britain at the beginning of the film, and at the end of the film replaces the much tinier general who attempts to lead the attack on Anticlimax's village. Incidentally, the design of Centurion Voluptuous is the only recurring Centurion design to be used in three of the, to date, nine animated Asterix movies. Also, Motus is a minor character from Asterix and the Banquet, so while it is possible the makers of this film just got the Centurions mixed up, I think it's more probable that they just gave him said name without realising that in this franchise's universe, it had already been taken. What? Got away? <laughs> now you listen, you go and get those guys or I'll drown you in warm beer! We are introduced to a small village in Kent that is still holding out against the invaders, where lives Asterix's English cousin, once removed, Anticlimax. In the film, he and his chief, my kingdom for an horse, are having a chat at the entrance of the village, which apparently has no form of door. This scene plays quite differently in the comic. It takes place inside the chief's hut, and features a Scottish chief, Mechanics, and an Irish chief, Overoptimistics. We are also shown how Anticlimax escaped from his village to the coast, to France. You really know how to roll! It's nothing really. Peter rode for Oxford, and Mater rode for Cambridge. <laughs> Chip off the old block and all that sort of rot, you know what I mean? <laughs> Stratocumulus has a much larger role in the film than he does in the book. Like Voluptuous, his design is completely altered, from short and fat, to slightly resembling Centurion Tonsillitis from Asterix and Caesar's Gift, only younger and more timid. They're transporting a barrel of magic potion to Britain, I know, because I heard them! We have to load of air superiors! Turn the ship around, sail to Britain! Thanks to a fish fight, the film features small appearances by Fully Automatics, Unhygienics, Cacophonics, Geriatrics, Impedimenta, and even Bacteria. The violent squabbles between the Fishmonger and Ironmonger did not become regular occurrences until the 14th Asterix adventure, and of the six forementioned characters, only Cacophonix had been fully established as a character by Asterix in Britain. 
Now, where were we? Ah, uh, your fish stick. Oh, yes. My fish are fresh! Oh, my foot! For some reason, Nobelix decides not to bring dogmatics with him to Britain, which is odd, as two stories earlier, he was keen for the little dog to come all the way to Egypt with them, against Asterix's advice. Which is even more idiotic when you consider the greater difference between France and Africa, and France and England. In the film, the exact opposite happens, as Obelix tells his dog that of course he'll be coming with them. The big role Dogmatics gets is when, after tracking down the cart thief, he accidentally samples some magic potion, allowing him to beat up Churchill and subdue the thief. In the comic book, the only obstacle our heroes face while crossing the channel is a Roman galley. In the film, before this happens, they save Economic Crisis, a Phoenician merchant whose ship is about to be attacked by the pirates. Economic Crisis had appeared in the fourth Asterix comic, and in the previous movie to this one, Asterix et la surprise du César. Empire ship! Oh my goodness, we are lost! No! Abandon ship into the lifeboat! What lifeboats? I sold them! You make a profit? Not bad. The scene where Obelix saves the Phoenicians from the pirates is also how Asterix gets the tea leaves, as Economic Crisis insists they take them as a reward, believing them to have absolutely no value. In the comic, Asterix notices the leaves at Getafix's hut. The druid doesn't actually know what they do, but suggests Asterix take some, which he does, and then forgets about until 35 pages later. This change was probably made because it is never revealed how Getafix got a hold of these leaves, which are native to exotic climates like India. Have you ever seen that? Huh? <laughs> oh yes, uh, it's called tea. Oh, it'll never catch on. The film's minor antagonists, outranked by Motus and Stratocumulus, are a comedic trio, the Curian Total Lapsus, a fat legionary, and a shorty soldier, later revealed to be Steve Gutenberg. Total Lapsus's design was taken from the unnamed Optio in The Soothsayer, removing him of his cape and adding a much buffer body. In the film, Total Lapsus also oversaw the legionaries testing every confiscated barrel of wine in London, and apparently at some point decided to join them in the search. The film implies that the fat legionary has acquired his permanently red nose after being repeatedly stamped on during the brief battle at the beginning. And one final note about this trio is that in the comic, the Decurion is leading twice as many men. Are you opposing the army and the authority of Rome? My lawn is smaller than your Rome is, but my pelum is considerably harder, I think, than your sternum is. The fact that the British drive on the left side of the road is commented upon by Asterix and Anticlimax, but in the film it is referred to after their cart horse collides with another cart horse, though this is due to the protagonists falling asleep at the reins. What's more, the road they are on is not wide enough for a left-hand and right-hand lane. I am not fat, understand? I'm not fat! I may be slightly chubby, but I am not fat, not at all! The landlord of the Jolly Boar and Dipsomaniacs are switched in the film. The personality of the much shorter Dipsomaniacs, renamed Gorlix, is changed from rather emotionless to being very talkative and very expressive. In addition to having all of his wine confiscated by the Romans, all of his food is consumed by Obelix. Here we are, gentlemen, your first British beers! <laughs> Isn't it warm enough? I say, shall I have him take the chill off it? A recurring joke not present in the comic is that Stratocumulus keeps slipping on the floor of General Motus's corridor, resulting in the destruction of his statues. <laughs> Obelix gets drunk after trying only one sample of wine. In the film, it takes a few swigs before the wine starts to affect him. Also, he uses his own helmet as a ladle, whereas in the book, he uses a legionary's helmet. Uh, I'm getting sleepy! 
Asterix and Anticlimax are given the address of the thief from the barman, who looks like a cross between unhygienics and fully automatics. In the comic book, the man tells them who he sold the barrel to, which happens after they rescue Obelix and find the thief. An unattended cart! <laughs> How fortunate for an unattended cart thief! Dipsomaniax's pub is totally destroyed by the Romans. In the film, only the furniture has been broken up. <laughs> Two of the comic's five pubs and their owners are not used in the film. Dipsomaniax's cousin, who knows the address of the thief, and the landlord, who inadvertently helps the Decurion to realise that Asterix and co. have lost the barrel of magic potion. I have an excellent fellow who sells it, but naturally I can't reveal it. Who is this fellow who sold you the wine? The rugby player's uniforms are changed from blue with white stripes and yellow with black stripes to all blue and all yellow. This alteration was obviously done to make things a bit easier for the animators. The Romans' incognito outfits are also changed so that instead of each being different, the trio are dressed alike. Oh, bravo! That is an intelligent game! We ought to play this in goal! It takes Asterix quite a while to decide whether the now super strong and super fast Hip Hip Hurax has indeed drunk the magic potion. In the film, he knows after the player makes his first punch. See there, lad. Aren't you the one who smashed in my head a while back? Let's not lose our heads, old matey, eh? It's not whether you win, it's how you play the game. <laughs> On the way back to Gaul, our heroes are spotted by the pirates. Redbeard orders his crew to speed away as fast as possible, resulting in the ship crashing onto an island. The captain still considers this a victory. In the film, as soon as Asterix and Obelix are sighted, he grabs an axe and sinks his ship. This moment actually occurred in Asterix and Cleopatra, and again in Asterix at the Olympic Games. These pirates are crazy! Asterix chez les Britons is overall one of the more faithful adaptations this comic book series has had. Very little is removed or tampered with from the original story, besides a few character designs, and a lot of what is added is quite funny. The animation is mixed, with the characters occasionally behaving quite erratically cartoonified, which sometimes enhances the comedy, and other times just makes you feel uncomfortable. The style is definitely not as lavish as the previous Asterix movie, which was produced only a year earlier by a different studio. The English dub has no notable cast, although Wikipedia claims that Phil Hartman and Frank Welker were involved. And while certainly possible, IMDb doesn't back this up. Amusingly, the native French characters are given French accents to naturally make the British characters sound more... British. Jack Bieber and Billy Kearns also voiced Asterix and Obelix in Asterix vs. Caesar, without making the characters sound artificially French. All you had to do was stop them! Well, they aren't moving. Sometimes you have to be polite, Obelix. Why don't we dig a tunnel to Britain? That's an idea I dig, Obelix. Get it? Dig? <laughs> Besides a cameo by the BC Beatles, there is nothing absent that I feel is significant, and if I had to pick one addition the filmmakers made that I like the best, it would have to be the Roman legionary giving a recipe for spinach soup. You eat some good olive oil, you get some bacon and some onions, slice them into thin slices, and say to say, SILENCE! And then simmer slowly. I say, would you mind awfully if I had a spot of milk in my potion? I am shocked and appalled.